All right, hello and welcome to the last week of instruction for summer 2020. I've uh, just got two more videos for you, this one and the next one. And then next week is the final exam. It's hard to believe we've already gone through an entire semester, but here we are. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Renaissance, and I'm going to talk about the 100 Years' War. So let's get started so this isn't too long. Uh, first thing, the 100 Years' War, 1337 to 1453. Notice that's not 100 years. It actually lasted longer than that. But 100 years is a lot easier to say than 118 Years' War. So, All right, a couple different reasons that this war starts. Um, there's some underlying causes. Uh, the English wanted to regain land that they were technically in charge of in France, but didn't actually control. And that goes all the way back to the to the early, early years of the English monarchy, 1066, the Battle of Hastings. And it had been kind of simmering underneath the underneath everything else for years. Uh, France, on the other hand, they wanted to control all of France. At one point in time, the English king controlled more of French territory than the French king did. There's also this competition over the wool trade in a place called Flanders. We know it better today as Belgium. And then there's that whole chivalry thing. The only way you could gain glory in feudalism was battlefield glory. And then there's this distraction from internal issues. Uh, social issues weren't going so well. This is in the middle of the Black Death. Economic issues, nobody liked the way politics were going, the Magna Carta, all that. So the easiest way to distract people is by having a good war. Now the immediate cause, the one that actually started the war, is a dispute over the French throne and who should actually be in charge. Now I have here a very poorly drawn family tree of the kings of France. And I mean, I it, part of the reason this video is late is because I was sitting there trying to make this look halfway professional and... I just can't do it, so I'm sorry. This is not going to be the best. Um, now, the way that the French system worked is everything went down the line of the oldest child. And only men could be king, and it could only be passed down through the male side of the family. So Philip III had a son named Philip IV. Philip IV had a son named Louis X and Philip V. Louis the X had a son named John I. John I dies. Then Philip V has a son named Charles. Charles dies before he can become king. So the only living child of Philip IV is Isabella of Venois. Isabella of Venois gets married to Edward II of England. Edward II and Elizabeth or Isabella have a child, Edward III should be the king according to their system. But the French didn't want an English king to be their king, so they kind of blew this entire system up. And in the end, Edward III is going to get angry and start the war. So who should be king? Philip III had a son who was not on this list. There is one son who never could have ever have been the king, Philip III, had another son whose name was Charles of Valois. Now, Philip of Valois, who is the son of Charles and the grandson of Philip, is chosen to be the next French king, even though he's not even on that list of candidates I showed you. Once the throne passes your line, you aren't supposed to go back if there are other eligible descendants. So that meant that as soon as Philip IV became king, Charles the other son of Philip III could not become king. So, rightly so, Edward III should have been king, and Edward III was angry about it. In 1337, Edward III sends a strongly worded letter to the French government saying he was the true king, produced his documents, showed everything, but it didn't matter. The French government is going to pass a law saying that the throne cannot pass through the female line, which had never been done before, but suddenly, there you go. He becomes king. Now, Edward, he's going to feel cheated, which I'm sure you could understand. And he's going to decide, you know what, I need to fight for my throne. 
Now, the Hundred Years' War is going to be fought almost completely on French soil. The armies are going to be controlled by actual knights and actual lords, and in some cases even by kings. And huge numbers of people are going to fight. There are over 10% of the population for both England and France who are going to be um, involved in this. Uh, the English Army, they've got foot soldiers, they've got long bowmen, and these long bows are like six feet tall. They are professional soldiers, and they're paid for by the king. Um, and their loyalty is to the king because he's the one paying them. Uh, the French Army, on the other hand, um, they've got cavalry, they've got foot soldiers, and they've got crossbows. Crossbows are more accurate, but they're harder to load, and it takes longer. They're loyal to the local lords, not the king, because it's the lords that pay them. They're not directly loyal to the king of France. In fact, their only loyalty to the king of France is just the lords have given their loyalty to the king of France. Three battles you have to know. The Battle of Crecy, which is in 1346. The Battle of Poitiers, which is in 1356. And the Battle of Agincourt, which is probably the most famous of these three battles, happens in 1415. So the Battle of Crecy, what happens there? It's the first time that the French longbow and the English, I'm sorry, the English longbow and the French crossbow have come into contact with each other. And the crossbow, like I said, it is considered pretty deadly. Uh, it's very accurate, but it has a short range. It's hard to reload, it's slow to reload. Uh, the longbow, dangerous at 400 yards, deadly at 100 yards. It's quick to reload. As soon as you can pull the arrow out of the quiver and put it onto the notch, you can shoot. Uh, a good longbowman can shoot three arrows for every one crossbow bolt. So there's this blinding shower of arrows that knock all the French cavalry off their horses. This mass confusion happens. And like a little cherry on top, the English are going to use cannon for the first time. Uh, it doesn't do a lot of damage, but it sure creates a lot of confusion. At the Battle of Poitiers, uh, King John II is actually out on the battlefield, and he is captured by the English army and sent back to England as a prisoner. The French army falls apart, and the old English empire in France is recreated. It's called the Angevin Empire. And England has got the upper hand for quite a while. Um, but then we got the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. Um, England has a force of somewhere between 6,000 and 9 people. It's actually led by King Henry. Uh, France, they've got somewhere between 15,000 and 36,000 people there. The numbers are a little bit, um, depending who you talk to, depends on the number. Um, also, depending on who you say was a combat participant will change the number as well. Uh, what we do know for sure, though, is the English lose at most 600 people. There are unknown numbers of wounded, but at least 600 people are killed. For the French, it's about 6,000 killed and somewhere between 700 and 2,000 captured. Uh, there were so many captured that um, the King of France even, or the King of England threatened to start killing prisoners. This was an absolutely humiliating defeat for the uh, French army. Now it sounds like the French are really not doing so well. Um, and they're really not, but there's one thing that kind of changes the, the tide of things, if you will, and that's Joan of Arc. Um, Joan of Arc, she was a 17-year-old girl. Who, she was a, a shepherd who has visions of greatness, and her visions are telling her that if she can get the prince of France crowned as the new king, that France will win the war. So she convinces the French army to let her lead them to the battle or to the city of Orleans where they rescue Prince Charles. Then she's able to fight to the city of Rheims where she goes to the cathedral where all the kings are supposed to be crowned and she gets the prince crowned as King Charles the seventh. But then she's captured by the Burgundians or Burgundians who were kind of sort of French, but they were loyal to England, and she is actually sold to the English. The English are going to put 
Joan of Arc on trial, and they're going to accuse her of being a witch, and she's eventually going to be burned at the stake. Now, in the end, Joan of Arc may not have actually won the war for the French, but she stimulates French pride, and the French start to fight harder, and France is able to fight to a draw. Let's just put it that way. England, on the, on the other hand, they get tired of the war. They get tired of spending the war. And they say, all right, King, if you want to keep fighting for your French territory, you can do that, but you've got to raise the money yourself. Now, what were the impacts of the war? Well, in England, it's devastated financially. France, devastated financially and physically. England... A lot of the noble families are killed off. In fact, if you are of English ancestry, it's very hard to trace your family past the Hundred Years' War. France, there's a huge population loss. In England, the English monarchy gets weaker and it leads to a civil war. In France, it leads to this idea of absolute monarchy and the French monarch becomes stronger. So the way England and France are affected is almost the opposite. All right, the Italian Renaissance. Uh, the Italian Renaissance is happening at the same time as the Hundred Years' War, and it goes on a little bit longer. Uh, roughly speaking, 1300 to 1600 is when the Italian Renaissance happens, and then there's a, a second Renaissance in Northern Europe that goes on a little bit later. Three things that are familiar, or that... Um, are in common with the Renaissance. Um, there's this extreme hostility to the Middle Ages. They look at the Middle Ages actually as the Dark Ages, and that's where the term Dark Age comes from. There's this fascination with ancient Rome and ancient Greece. People start learning Roman, r learning Greek philosophy, and they learn Latin and Greek languages. And studying the ancients becomes the cool thing to do. Now, a big question that people have is, why did it start in Italy? Well, it's because Italy was still a bunch of independent city-states. Uh, Italy never became one of those feudalistic societies. There weren't knights and lords and all that in Italy. Italy was about money. Uh, one of the most wealthy families of all time, the de' Medici family, they lived in Florence, and their family served as bankers for the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church had tons of money. And when you have money, you want to show off your things. You want to show off how much money you have, and that's what the Italians started to do. The fact that Italy was urban meant that ideas could spread very quickly and very easily. easily. And then Italy also had all the Roman ruins, oh wow, the Roman ruins around them, which made them kind of hark back to the old days. And, you know, Rome used to be great, Italy can be great again. Now, what were the ideas of the Renaissance? Well, there's individualism, and then there's this idea of secularism. So it's individualistic, and it is not so uh, religious as previous times might have been. Renaissance thinkers, they're the ones that create the autobiography, and how much more individualistic can you get? You have to think that you're important enough that somebody wants to read a book about your life. I mean, that's some individualism right there. And creators wanted to be credited for their work. Uh, Michelangelo um, sculpted the Pieta, which is the Mother Mary holding the crucified body of Jesus. And everybody thought that Donatello did it. And it made Michelangelo so mad that in the middle of the night, he went back to the statue and carved his name across Mother Mary so everybody who looks at it knew who the actual creator was. Uh, Renaissance thinkers, they wanted a lot of attention, so there's the extravagant dress, there's the fancy manners, there's personal hygiene, all of that stuff is going to become important, and consumerism is going to be an important thing as well. Um, you know, you want to display your wealth, you want to show how wealthy you are, and you are going to start showing off your wealth. How do you do that? Paintings, because paintings show how wealthy you are, and Paintings were more affordable at the same time because there was a change in the way paintings were done. And it all becomes about money. Time is money. For the first time, 
Renaissance thinkers are the ones who think of quantification. They think of time and money in terms of each other. Now, the philosophy of the day is humanism. Um, it wasn't enough just to be alive. It was learning that made somebody an act a human. Learning made somebody a man. Uh, to be truly human, one had to be educated. They couldn't just exist. Um, there was this idea that man was the greatest of God's creatures. And these humanists, they start to go back to ancient Latin texts and ancient Greek texts, and they take out all the the Christian um, ideas and just say, no, Aristotle wasn't a Christian. He was just a man, and here's what he thought. So these humanists are going to retranslate ancient texts, reevaluate them, and try to reinterpret them, if you will. Renaissance art, some of these are very, very famous paintings. Uh, you've got the Mona Lisa on the left. You've got the Last Supper on the right. And down at the bottom, you've got the uh, School of Athens. And these are three of the most famous paintings come out of the Renaissance. Um, Christian values and religious motifs kind of become less and less important. And real-world things become more important. Uh, for example, Mona Lisa is supposed to be the portrait of a woman. Um, the School of Athens, that has very little, if anything, to do with Christian ideas. And the Last Supper was a modern take on an old Christian ideal. Now, the bodies are going to be presented more realistically, more scientifically. Michelangelo would pay people to dig up dead people so that he could dissect them to figure out how the body works. Uh, there are new technologies such as oil painting, before oil paints were used, they had to use frescoes. Frescoes were basically uh, like concrete and egg to get certain colors, certain tints. And you had to wait for the first layer of fresco to dry before you could paint anything else on it, or else everything would get messed up. And money again. Um, artists would figure out how to make the most out of their dollar. They would find ways to make money. A great example of this is Albrecht Dürer, who was a, uh, a northern German. Instead of painting a bunch of individual paintings, he would paint one, one wood block. He would carve out a painting into a wood block, and then he would just stamp that wood block over and over again. He basically worked smarter instead of harder. The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. I have had to read this book once. Uh, I did survive, uh, believe it or not. It's a little bit boring, it's a little bit dry, but it's very influential for its day. It, the Prince is a how-to manual on how to govern Florence, Italy. And he's basically telling the Medici family, here's what you can do to be a better leader. And it's filled with a bunch of harsh advice. Uh, he, he says that you know sometimes you have to murder people, sometimes you have to betray people. Uh, you have to do whatever it takes to stay in power. And sometimes you have to give the people a little bit, and then sometimes you have to slap them in the face. Um, the Prince is considered one of the first political science works of all time. And people still read it today, and for some it is still influential today. Uh, if you ever get bored and you have nothing better to do, pick up a copy of The Prince and read it. It's not that long. Now, the Northern Renaissance, I did mention that. Um, there's a Southern Renaissance and there's a Northern Renaissance. And let's do the secret word here. The secret word for this video is going to be research, R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H. I hope everybody is working on their research paper right now. You've got one week to do it. And I'm looking forward to reading your research papers. Just remember to use scholarly peer-reviewed journals available through Galileo. Make sure it's about five, maybe six pages long. And if you have any questions on your research paper, email me, find me on Discord, message me through Blackboard, whatever it is, and I'll be happy to answer your question. So today's secret word is research. All right, moving on. Why did the Renaissance spread towards the north? One reason is warfare. There were armies that invaded from Spain and France, and when they took, when they went back home from Italy, they took the ideas with them. It's also students. 
there were a lot of schools in Italy, and when those students got done with their studies, they took their ideas home too. Uh, another reason the Renaissance spreads is the idea of movable type. Uh, instead of having to carve out an entire page, you would just carve out letters, and then you can move those letters around to print different pages, and that made books cheaper. Cheaper books meant ideas could spread further and faster. Now, there were some differences between the Northern Renaissance and the Southern Renaissance, or the, the Northern Renaissance and the Italian Renaissance, however you want to put it. In Italy, most of the patrons, most of the people buying stuff were the wealthy elite. Well, in the northern part of Europe, they were mostly kings. And there was more Christian value in the northern Renaissance than the southern Renaissance. So, where in Italy, they're reevaluating Aristotle and Plato and Greek or Latin Roman ideas, Northern Renaissance are going back and they're looking at early church works and they're reevaluating church works by St. Peter, St. Paul, things like that. There's also more um, variation in the social backgrounds in the North. Not everybody in the North was wealthy. And because of that, Northern Renaissance people were willing to write more for the common people. So the Northern Renaissance, it's more Christian, it's more for the everyday man the Southern Renaissance, less Christian, and more for the wealthy elite. One of the big Northern thinkers is Erasmus. He was a Dutch philosopher. Um, he's famous for saying men are, are made, not born. And he wanted to blend this traditional Christianity with that idea of humanism. So he's all about patience, calmness, being broad-minded, but he brings in Christian love, faith, and hope. And he believed in education, and he tried to redo the New Testament to make it more accessible for the everyday man. Northern Renaissance art, more religious elements. Painting still shows some people in prayer pose, but the people are more realistic. Um, the the um, topics can sometimes be double-sided, if you will. The top picture here by a guy named Peter Bruegel, and it shows almost like a war scene. It's supposed to be the Romans taking out a Jewish settlement, but what it really is is the Spanish army taking out a, a, a Dutch settlement. So there's kind of the double entendre there. And then in the bottom picture, that's by Albert Durer, who I mentioned a minute ago. You can see Christ on a crucifix with, with the Lord behind him. But you can see that not everybody's in a prayer pose and the people are, you know, more realistic looking. Because the North was cooler, frescoes wouldn't dry, and oil paintings are almost all that was used in the North. And um, there's also this idea of perspective. You'd probably draw like this and didn't even know who created it. When you take a 2D drawing and you add shading and shadows to make it look like it's 3D, that's actually an invention of Albrecht Durer. All right, Renaissance life. Um, Catholics and Protestants, we'll talk about the Reformation later in the week, but the Reformation, the split in the Catholic Church is happening at this time. And so Catholics and Protestants looked at marriage different. Uh, for Catholics, men marry late because they have to have enough land to support their marriage. Um, divorce doesn't exist. There's no way to get a divorce. You can only get in a marriage annulled. Uh, marriage was easy. It just took an oral promise. Uh, I promise I'll marry you was enough to actually get married in the eyes of the Catholic Church. And you might have said in your life, I promise I'll marry you and not have ever meant it. Well, that caused a lot of grievances because even back then there were a lot of people who didn't mean it. I was just kidding when I said I would marry you. Nope, too bad the Catholic Church says we're married. So then you'd have to go through Catholic Church court and figure out, are you really married or not? For Protestants, it was seen as this liberation from women. Uh, being married was better than being a nun. Um, divorce was allowed in certain cases, and Protestants allowed contraception. Even in the 1500s, believe it or not, contraception was 70% effective. Seven out of ten pregnancies were prevented. Family size. Um, Pregnancy happened a lot more then than it does today. Um, on average, if you are a woman and you are listening to this, you were giving birth on average every 24 to 30 months, and you have about a 10% chance of dying in childbirth. 
Also, if you were a city-born baby, you were less healthy than a country-born baby because of disease and because of pollution. If any of you listening are a second daughter, then you would probably have become a nun because only the first daughter would be allowed to marry and the uh, dowry or the bride price, if you will, was given to that first daughter and went with that first daughter to her marriage. Witchcraft was a thing. Uh, you may have heard of the Salem Witch Trials. That happens in the late 1600s. That's towards the, well, I'm sorry, not late, but the early to mid-1600s. That's actually kind of the end of the witchcraft craze. Uh, the witchcraft craze started closer to 1400, and in the 200-year time, time frame between 1450 and 1650, there are something like 250,000 documented burnings of witches. Of those 200 to 250,000 witches, 85% of them were women. Women didn't trust each other, and accusing somebody of being a witch was a way to get ahead in life. And you can see there a, a drawing of a witch burning, just uh, for your delight. Renaissance food, because we all like to eat. Uh, the food was either salted or dried, and that's what preserved it. Um, a fish called herring was eaten often. It's a very salty fish. It's still eaten today in Scandinavian countries. If you've been to Ikea, you can probably find pickled herring in the food section. Uh, fresh crops were only available late spring to early autumn. And everything had beans with it. Why beans? Because beans would absorb the salt from the meat. They also had two sauces. Just like today, we have ketchup and mustard. They had yellow sauce and they had green sauce. The yellow sauce was made out of ginger and saffron. The green sauce was ginger, uh, cardamom, cloves, and herbs. And pepper was so expensive that pepper was used as money. And we'll talk more about that with European, um, European exploration. Table manners, yes, they had some, but they weren't very good. Um, there were no forks. Forks were seen as dangerous weapons. Everybody ate with their hand, but you had to wash your hand before you touched the meat. So what they would do is they would have a bucket or a bowl in the corner of the room. Everybody had to go dip their hands in that water before they touched the food. But you know what? Everybody's touching the same water, so really everybody is still touching the same food. Uh, at the dinner table, you have people scratching with fleas and lice because this was a time period before everybody took baths. Um, in fact, for a while, people thought baths were... Um, unhealthy for you. You could get sick from taking a bath is what they thought. So table manners were very questionable at the time. And then last but not least, there are some other changes to mention. There were changes in warfare. Uh, you start to get these large armies. At the time, the Swedish army was the biggest with about 200,000 200, full-time soldiers. Eventually, the French army is going to have something like 400,000 full-time soldiers. Gunpowder starts to be used. Cannons start to be used. Uh, I mentioned cannons for the first time in the Hundred Years' War, and they just become more and more uh, common. Then there's the invention of the salvo. That's when you fire all your guns at once. Um, if you think of the Civil War, where you have three lines of people, line one is, fires, while line two aims, and line three is, is um, loading their weapon, then line two fires while line three aims, and then line one starts to load their weapons. That's what the salvo is, where the entire line shoots their weapons at once, and that was a creation of the Swedish army. Uh, conscription, where you are drafted into the army by force. That is a change that happens during the, ref or the uh, Renaissance. And it becomes really expensive to maintain armies, because like the French army uh, is paying all of the going to start paying all of the money, all the training, all of the wages, all the food, and it becomes so expensive to maintain an army during the Renaissance that, in some cases, armies don't actually fight because it's too expensive to replace the soldiers. And we also have printing press. A movable type replaces block printing, which means reusable letters, which means it's cheaper, faster, and easier to print. Uh, old curly gothic script is abandoned for Carolingian style writing. That's what we use today. I've got a copy or a little picture of Carolingian minuscule right there. 
Uh, you also get the idea of lowercase letters once upon a time. You could only write in uppercase because lowercase didn't exist. And page numbers are invented. And because of this printing press, this movable type, and the ease of writing, uh, ideas start to spread further and faster. Okay, one last thing. If you happen to watch this video between now and Wednesday, send me an email with um, your suggestions on whether I should cover the Reformation and European exploration on Wednesday, or if you would be okay with me moving European exploration to next Monday. Um, if, if that's your preference, let me know, and I can do one video on Monday. Or if you don't mind a longer video on Wednesday, let me know that too. Um, just if you watch this video between now and Wednesday, let me know which of those two options you prefer. And majority rules, whoever says what they like the most is the way I'll do it. So until Wednesday, I look forward to those emails telling me which way you, you want me to do the video for next week or for, for Wednesday. And if you want a video for next week or not, or if you just want it all done at once. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.